So this sets a stage, the millennial generation. Who are they and, and when did they come about? Well, it's interesting. Um, it, we, we think they started in the early 1980s. Uh, they came along in the early 1980s. And it's interesting, there were a few trends that started around this time. Right around 1981 and 1982, a number of, of uh, social trends started changing in an interesting way at the end of the consciousness revolution. Uh, drug abuse among all age brackets and alcohol consumption per capita all started receding after about 1981, 1982. It's amazing. Just look at the data. It's all been kind of linearly downward on a gradual down track. Uh, the abortion rate, the divorce rate, all of these things have been receding from the early 1980s. Again, boomers, you know, with their, in their yuppie phase and their family values, when this, was, this was the time when, when that started. Um, something, and, and another thing that happened at the time was that many books and articles came out about how badly kids have been treated in the 70s. We had to do better by kids, give them a greater sense of protection, structure, a collective mission. And 1982 is an interesting year. The individual year is interesting because a new kind of bumper sticker started appearing on cars all over America. Baby on board. Do you remember that? Baby, on, where did that come from? There's nothing like that, you know, in earlier decades. Baby on board. And it was affixed to a new kind of car. The minivan. Remember that? The family-oriented minivan with, with, with 15 different ways of buckling that precious cargo in their seats. Back when Gen Xers were kids, the favorite child restraint system was just tell the kid to do this. You know? <laughs> that was it. Um, we actually, for, for Ford Motor Company, we actually looked back at uh, images of children in decades of ads, and it's absolutely fascinating in the 70s to see how different the treatment was. Uh, uh, you know, you just, you remember those hatchbacks? You would just throw in the luggage and throw in the kids and wham, you know, that, that was it. That was it. Now we're on a vacation. Uh, the other one I remember, and, and think of this, think of, think of what we're in with the millennial era with William and Martha Sears attachment parenting. I mean, everything, you cannot be too close to your kids, right? Back in the 70s, they had these ads for these, these Impala station wagons, and they had this, this long, this long uh, sort of to make everything look longer in the ad, and they showed these two parents, each looking different ways in the front seat, and way in the back were these two kids fighting each other. And then the tagline on the ad was, another advantage to our Impala station wagon. <laughs> says, and, and the tagline was, more space, more distance between you and the kids. Okay. See, that is the difference in era. That was the Gen X childhood era. We're a completely different era now. Um, another thing happened in the early 1980s. Remember those Childless Devil movies? Bombed at the box office. No one wanted to see that anymore. Instead, it was cuddly baby movies. Remember? Baby Boom, Parenthood, Three Men and a Baby. We all saw that stuff. Even weird movies like Raising Arizona. And about a, about a decade later, there were the young adolescent kids of soccer moms in the early 90s. Movies like Looking for Bobby Fischer or Sleepless in Seattle. These were movies about kids who inspired their parents, at that time usually boomer parents, to become better people. Again, we had never seen that treatment in the pop culture of kids before. Um, the protection of kids hugely increased. The entire home protection industry, all those devices, gadgets you put on your plugs and your stoves and all that, that became a multi-billion dollar industry during the 1980s. Fathers present at the birth of their children, even in the late 1970s, only 20%. By the late 1980s, 65%, thanks to the Lamaze movement and many innovations of that era. Today, it's nearly 80%. Huge changes occurred. Uh, and the protection of kids, all the new kinds of helmets you had to put on kids, and the new kinds of materials on playgrounds. Many historians call this most recent period one of the great child protection waves in American history, on par with that wave we saw for the GI generation during the Progressive Era. Um, but it's amazing. And by the end of the Cold War, by the early 1990s, opinion polls said that the America's m most important long-term objective is to raise up a better generation of children. I hate to say that. It's kind of an implicit judgment on Xers, isn't it? But anyway, that's the way, that's the way it was put in the opinion polls. Um, and we began to ent enter something which uh, defined both Clinton and Bush as boomer presidents. That is what Newsweek calls kinder politics, referring to kids to get anything through Congress in order to buttress your own popularity. Well, remember, uh, uh, Clinton almost despaired of, of being thrown out of office in 1994. Remember when, when Newt Gingrich and the... the 
Republican uh, contract in America one, and he talked to Dick Morris, and Dick Morris told him, you got to get back to kids. Talk about V-chips and, and curfews and cops and shops, and, and he did, and, and it was, was very successful. It was one of his very successful strategies. Uh, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush, too, has talked a lot about kids uh, uh, and, and constantly talks about them. Bill Clinton in 1996 came on national TV and he says, my fellow Americans, I have something, um, I, I have something important to report. I'm delighted, in fact, to announce that uh, we've just signed a treaty with Russia and for the first time in decades there will be no nuclear missiles pointed at America's children. Right, that's the way he said it. It's interesting. I had a Gen Xer friend of mine, someone in, at that time it was in his mid-twenties, and he phoned me up that night and he said, well, what about us? You know, they're, <laughs> they're not pointed at us either. Uh, <laughs> but again, he's not in the right generation. No one, no one talked about his generation like that. Um, so what this new kind of upbringing did is ultimately create a different generation, well, not only with different attitudes, but with different behavior patterns. And some of these differences in behavior have been quite striking. And I want to point a few of them out. Uh, because they've been underreported by the media, but I think we need to take these in their full context. One is, and there are many different data uh, charts you could see this in, but approximately a, a 65 to 70 percent reduction in serious youth crime uh, over the time that millennials have been e entering these age, e entering the you know the teen age brackets, and you can see the same thing now with young adulthood, uh, 19 to 24. This is maybe the most dramatic. Uh, decline in youth violence in American history. Certainly it's the most dramatic dec decline since we've taken age bracketed data since the 1930s. Uh, but it's not just crime, it's risk taking across the board. And if you're interested in this, go, there's a CDC site and you can, you can look at this. It's called Youth Risk Surveillance Indicators. There are dozens of them. And you see that almost all of them show a declining propensity for risk. Everything from sex in high school to wearing a seat belt, all of these things are down. Uh, and you ask kids about it, they say, well, I have long-term plans. I don't want to mess them up. And furthermore, I don't want to let people down, my friends, maybe my parents. Um, what about this one? Huge reduction, 35 to 40 percent reduction in teen pregnancy and teen abortion. Um, again, we saw this little uptick, actually. All, all, all age brackets actually had a uh, a little uptick in fertility last year. Uh, but nonetheless, this has been a dramatic, a dramatic shift. What about this one? Substance. Now, I should just say that since boomers came along, tracking substance abuse is such a complex subject. Um, <laughs> there's so many things to measure. Um, <laughs> but, but here, just to look at a couple of these, uh, it's in interesting that probably the most damaging forms of substance abuse uh, on, a, on a lifelong basis is alcohol and cigarettes. And uh, for these two things, we have the lowest rates ever today in grades 8, 10, and 12 on a, on a nationwide basis. More so in, in urban areas, the decline is more so in, urbi in urban areas, less so in rural areas. In fact, there's some rural areas which see substance abuse still up. Uh, but on an overall national basis, we see it uh, certainly down. What about another thing that's very un like about this generation? What about the popular, you remember Generation X was defined as, you know, me incorporated, do it myself. But this generation has been raised at a time when in the schools we've been pushing teamwork, team teaching, team grading, group projects, the whole community service movement, uh, the whole small school movement, the whole movement towards small learning communities, which has been so huge. Um, uh, student juries, there are now a thousand, at least a thousand school, high schools around the country where teens sit in judgment with other teens. That is to say, enforcing rules as peer rules. Um, Non-competitive sports, the list goes on and on. I know in, in Massachusetts they're introducing something called social recess, which as a boy, I just want to tell you, that doesn't sound very inviting to me, social <laughs> recess. A dodgeball without the ball or something like that. I, uh, but you, can, you can see some of, these, some of these other trends as well. Um, sometimes I have uh, people call me and they say, one of the big problems, I think, with today's youth is that, that we, have to, we, have to, we have to make them want more in their future. We want them to aspire higher. I don't see that a problem with millennials. Uh, I see their aspirations as being quite high. I see the problem as 
our institutions being unable to deliver on those aspirations. And don't worry about their aspirations. Uh, and we're going to come back to that in a second. What about trends in voting? This is kind of interesting. Uh, 1996 was the last year in which the 18 to 29 year old bracket was totally filled by Generation X. And we see the lowest, lowest voting rate in a presidential election for that age bracket that we've ever measured, 35%. It also wasn't a very exciting election, Dole versus Clinton. You know, that wasn't very exciting. Um, but look how it's gone up, 42%, 52%, and we think it's going to go up again this next uh, election. And as an interesting measure of that possibility, take a look at the voting in the New Hampshire primary that was just done, okay? I, I compare 2008 to 2000 because these were the two elections in which both parties had open tickets, right? So it's a good basis of comparison. But take a look at the difference, and in in both of them went up, but youth went up a lot more. Well, uh, as many of you know, this is a baby boomlet or echo boom generation. Uh, uh, you can also see here why Gen Xers are called a baby bust, right? And it's interesting how the fertility rate, the rise in fertility rate itself, says something very important about the wantedness of this generation. The frontier of uh, contraceptive, uh, of well, of, of reproductive medicine, I should say, back in the 70s it was contraception, but certainly in the 80s it's been fertility clinics and wanting to have more kids. This is also, as many of you know, the most racially and ethnically diverse generation uh, today. And uh, just over 40% are either non-white or Latino, 20% at least, 20% of this generation has at least one immigrant parent, 10% of this generation has at least one non-U.S. citizen parent. And of course, in certain counties like LA and Miami-Dade, that's up around 50%. Um, interestingly though, these positive trends we just mentioned are actually most dramatic on a percentage basis among the minorities, uh, not among the white, uh, the white majority. And most millennials themselves feel that they deal with race and ethnicity much better than older people. Uh, they feel like they get along fine if older people would leave them alone. The, the one area of tension, not just in high school, particularly in college, we see among millennials, the new area of tension is not so much race and ethnicity, but class and money. Uh, that's becoming a big issue because they come from, <laughs> these millennials come from boomer and increasingly exer families who are, have a huge spread on the income distribution scale. So what they can do with their money, what they can't do becomes a bigger issue. Well, we predicted many of these trends back when we wrote our first book, uh, generational book in 1991, and many people are now beginning to recognize some of these things going on. But I think they don't, again, recognize the generational uh, driver behind it. Uh, of course, the kids themselves, they understand. <laughs> the kids understand what's going on. Uh, if you're interested in this, we actually, because uh, now I'm going to move on to millennials, but in our books, we have a book called Generations in 1991, the fourth turning in 1997, where we actually suggest that there is a, a rhythm or sequence in the kinds of American generations we've had, not only America, but we're now looking around the world. And we see that they follow certain kind of archetypes. They follow in certain order. Hero generations, for example, are protectively raised, come of age during a time of emergency, and are institutionally powerful, powerful in the outer world the rest of their lives. These profit archetypes are born after a great crisis. They come of age spearheading the next spiritual awakening, the religious or cultural awakening, and they become inner focused the rest of their lives and they preside over the next crisis as elders. Uh, not hard to see with elder boomers, is it? You could be taking America anywhere, but uh, good, someplace good. 